Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's take a look at the headlines first. Targeted attacks continue unabated in Jammu and Kashmir. Afghan refugees reluctantly return to Taliban rule as Pakistan expels 1.7 million refugees. And India counters terrorism on all fronts. Terrorism today has spread across international borders, serving its sole purpose of disturbing peace and tranquility in the world. It has always destroyed the efforts of like-minded entities that relentlessly work to maintain peace across the globe. One of these entities is India, a country that has always been a victim of terrorism emanating from Pakistan. However, New Delhi has always preached what it follows taking a strong stand against terrorism and extremism on each front, regardless if the terrorism is to be countered on its soil or international platforms. India never has and never will abstain from condemning and countering terrorism. We have the special report. India has always been the target of terrorism, sponsored, protected and bred by Pakistan. Forces centered in Islamabad have been proven to back terrorism, attacking numerous cities in India and taking hundreds of innocent lives in the process. Be it the Bombay blasts of 1993, the armed attack on India's Parliament House in 2001, the Delhi bomb blast of 2005, the 2611 attacks on India's financial capital Mumbai in 2008, the Pathan Court attacks of 2016, or the Pulwama attacks of 2019. India has been the prime target and the main sufferer in each of these attacks, which Islamabad orchestrated. These attacks caused India the loss of both life and property. However, the reality of India's counter-terrorism efforts has changed. The country has been taking stringent steps to counter-terrorism, portraying its strong stand against the menace on each and every level. Not just acquiring and manufacturing cutting-edge war weapons, India has also deployed multi-level strategies to counter terrorism on the ground. Ranging from drone monitoring and increased border patrol in sensitive areas near the LOC and several joint missions executed by counter terrorism and intelligence agencies like NIA, the Army and the police. India's counter-terrorism efforts continue to protect India on each and every front. Today, a good government, a strong government, stands up for its people. Stands up for its people like good governance is necessary at home, right judgments is necessary abroad. That if we take today a strong position on terrorism, we take a strong position because we are big victims of terrorism. We will have no credibility if we say, you know, when terrorism affects us, it is very serious, but when it happens to somebody else, you know, that is not so serious. We have to have a consistent position. Time and again, the world has witnessed terror attacks like the 9-11 attack on the Twin Towers in New York City and the attack on the Sri Lankan national cricket team in 2009 in Lahore. And the most recent one being orchestrated by the terrorists belonging to Hamas amid the ongoing Israel-Palestine conflict, which has escalated to a state of war since October 7. This ongoing conflict until now has resulted in the loss of property, totaling billions of dollars and the death of more than 10,000 people inflicting damage on both sides of the Israel-Gaza border. Even in the international matters of countering terrorism, Indian diplomats have repeatedly advocated international peace every time. Recently, the matter related to the immediate humanitarian truce in the Israel-Hamas conflict leading to a cessation of hostilities was brought up by the UN General Assembly, 
to which India's Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations, Yojana Patel, gave a befitting reply for its abstaining to vote in that reference. She explained how India wanted a midway solution through dialogue and not violence, which would ultimately cause harm to innocent lives. The terror attacks in Israel on 7th October were shocking and deserve condemnation. Our thoughts are also with those taken hostages. We call for their immediate and unconditional release. Terrorism is a malignancy and knows no borders, nationality or race. India has always supported a negotiated two-state solution to the Israel-Palestine issue, leading to the establishment of a sovereign, independent and viable state of Palestine, living within secure and rec recognized borders, side by side in peace with Israel. No matter whether terror attacks which cause harm to innocent lives are orchestrated on Indian soil by terrorists belonging to Pakistan or are executed by Hamas terrorists resulting in hundreds of casualties amid the Israel-Gaza conflict. India's efforts have always been to ensure peace and counterterrorism, no matter the cost and efforts that need to be employed. The shadow of terror continues to loom over the Kashmir Valley and those who were driven out by the Islamic terrorists are in the line of fire once again. Since the start of the year, there have been a series of targeted killings of people, of minority communities, migrant workers and unarmed policemen to create fear and paranoia in the Union Territory. In the latest incident, Parkback terrorists within a week targeted two security personnel and one non-local labourer of Uttar Pradesh in the region. Let's delve into the details. The scourge of park back terrorism is once again rearing its ugly head in the sacred land of Kashmir, a land where the valour of brave civilians and determined police personnel is tested by relentless adversaries. On the fateful day of October 29, the very heart of Jammu and Kashmir was rocked by a harrowing incident. A brave Jammu and Kashmir police inspector was gravely wounded in a ruthless, calculated attack. But the horror did not stop there. In another terror incident, a migrant worker from Uttar Pradesh, a man named Mukesh, was ruthlessly gunned down by terrorists in the Tumchi Naupura area. Mukesh, who held dreams and aspirations close to his heart, tragically succumbed to the callous act of terror. Shockingly, the forces of darkness struck once more, this time taking the life of a police officer in his own home in Baramula district. This marks the third targeted attack in the valley in just three days. More than a dozen innocent lives have been cruelly taken by these acts of terror since the beginning of this year. Seven lives were callously snuffed out in Rajori earlier this year. In the year 2022, the region bore witness to the deaths of 40 civilians with over 220 innocents bearing the scars of violence inflicted upon them. According to the South Asia Terrorism Portal, nearly two dozen security personnel have laid down their lives in the line of duty within the Union Territory this year. These targeted attacks come at a time when the situation along the line of control has heated up, with security forces reporting two ceasefire violations this month alone. 
This is clearly a desperate attempt by Pakistan to create fear and terror in Kashmir, a region that has seen remarkable socio-economic growth in recent years. It's absolutely essential that the perpetrators are immediately app apprehended and brought to justice. It shows Pakistan's extreme desperation in trying to push in as many terrorists as possible before the onset of winters. All our, none of our attempts are fructifying. We have killed almost about 15 to 20 terrorists in the last one month who've been attempting to cross the border. It's absolutely essential that a mega manhunt is launched not only in the Baramula district but in the neighboring districts also so that they are not allowed to slip away. Pakistan's actions expose it as a state that supports terrorism and aims to instill fear among the people of Kashmir. Nevertheless, these heinous acts will not derail Jammu and Kashmir's path to development as Indian security forces remain resolute in countering these sinister plots. The people of the region stand united against these forces of darkness with an unwavering determination to overcome the challenges that threaten the peace and prosperity of our beloved land. To delve deeper into this matter, I had a conversation with former Director General of Police of Uttar Pradesh, Vikram Singh. During the discussion, he not only highlighted the root causes of targeted killings in Jammu and Kashmir, but also offered his insights on potential solutions to be taken by Government of India and the Jammu and Kashmir administration to address the issue of targeted killings. Let's take a look. Sir, there has been a surge in targeted attacks of security personnel and non-local laborers in Jammu and Kashmir. Like re recently we witnessed two security personnel have been injured and one non-local has been killed in a targeted attack. So, sir, what do you think? What are the root causes behind these targeted attacks? Shivangi on expected lines and totally on predictable lines too. The two police officers were gunned down in the most cowardly manner in their homes. One officer was playing cricket and the other was absolutely doing nothing. He was probably on leave also. Mukesh, resident of Unnao, Uttar Pradesh, was going to send money to his wife before the Karwachot festival. Again, a very cowardly attack and gunned down. Killing of civilians, whether in Israel or Kashmir or anywhere, is the easiest things to do and vermin and small type criminals can do it also. There's no bravado about it. And when you start killing civilians, the grassroots workers like Sarpanch and Pradhams and also non-Muslim migrant labor, the indications are very clear that you are desperate. Desperate for what? To create a divide in the state and also give a message that militancy is alive. The ground reality is that militancy is almost finished. 178 encounters of which there are more than 40 foreign foreigners in that. Recovery of sophisticated weapons and arms and munitions goes to show that a befitting reply has been given. Okay. Sir, so, um, following this question, I have this, do you really believe that Indian security forces are countering Pakistan for its actions in Kashmir Valley? Two ceasefire violations in recent targeted killings of civilians and non-Muslim migrant workers. The village people, the, the grassroots workers goes to indicate the desperation. Of course, the security personnel have done a wonderful job, the like of which I have not seen in my lifetime. Unprecedented work has been done in neutralizing, collecting actionable intelligence, sharing of intelligence, area domination. And yes, not only that, when it comes to community policing experiments, they have done a wonderful job in promoting jobs, in also giving the helping hand, giving coaching to those who are aspiring for services. And yes, also giving a helping hand and preventing radicalization. That, of course, is a wonderful thing. And I feel that it is almost at the level where terrorism is breathing its last. It's already went into the ICU the moment there was abrogation of Article 370. They all went to the ICU. Because this terrorism on the face value looks like terrorism, but it was a business model for some vested interest and some special interest groups. They are dying out. Now, since 
hundreds and thousands of crores of a business model is about to die. There is bound to be some ripple, some opposition in some quarters. And that is where the problem arises. This is like Charage Seher Hoon Ab Bujha Chahta Hoon. The last attempt of a dying person to get up, but a person who has been in the ICU for so many months, it is absolutely impossible to even think of running for a marathon. Those days are over. Khalil Khan ke faakte udhane ke zamane chale gaya. So, sir, what do you think? What can be the motives of these perpetrators behind these killings and attacks? <clears throat> as simple, it's a very obvious thing to understand. It's not rocket science. The killing of these civilians is to drive a message and give a communal divide. The non-Muslim migrants, the grassroots workers, and unfortunately, 5,500 Kashmiri pundits migrated also because out of te terror and fear. But the government intervened swiftly and gave the protection and the rest is history. So why they do it is to give a message to the world and to the sponsors because they get money from the sponsor that we are still alive kicking and we are in the reckoning. But see the ground reality. They are not in the reckoning. It is so easy to arm infiltrate weapons and through the drone incursions, you can indeed infiltrate drugs, weapons, arms and ammunition, walkie-talkies. But that also has been contained to a very great measure. The intelligence is at a different level. But the message was that we are in the reckoning. Look where they were in 1990s. Look where they were in the early uh, 2010s. And look where they are now. The last two years have seen the death knell of most of the leading terrorists are now no longer active. They have been neutralized. The second liners have been neutralized. The fresh entrants, as the security professional said, that of the almost 80 that joined the ranks, 60 have been accounted for. And that is some cause of satisfaction that where as the new entrants were in three figures, now they're barely in two figures. The area domination, actionable intelligence, that intelligence is now forthcoming and is coming spontaneously also is a matter of satisfaction. Initially, intelligence was not forthcoming. It was some task getting the intelligence. But now, I visited Kashmir very recently and I was so happy to know the cooperation and the coordination between the common people and the law enforcement agencies, the administration and the common people. That is the success story after the abrogation of Article 370. And that, of course, speaks volumes that people are forthcoming. What's your view? What steps should be taken by the government of India and the Jammu and Kashmir administration to prevent these targeted killings from happening? Terrorism in Kashmir has a long history and they cannot be just cut and dried or quick fix solutions. The solutions there at Shivangi have to be at a multi-pronged level. Public police dialogue, government public dialogue, a communication interface and a communication platform. Never can a government or a police exist or function efficiently in a vacuum. The public confidence is the basic premise and the basic reason and the basic ingredient of any successful administration. So police, government and the people have to be on the same platform. Then identify what is plaguing the youth. Kashmir youth, as you'd be aware, Shivangi, has done so well in sports in civil services examinations. Wherever they have become, they have reached the top, not only in Kashmir in the country, but at the universal arena also. So that is the success story. Bring out the talent of the youth, of the people. Give tourism a chance again, filmmaking a chance in Kashmir, industrialize Kashmir. And I'm happy to say that malls are coming up in Kashmir. Industrialization has happened. Give jobs to every youngster so that they don't look towards those who want to ensnare them into the dangerous and the illegitimate path of terrorism. The Kashmir youth have everything going their way. Industrialization, job opportunities, education, and there's so many avenues today that are open. And last but not the least, don't allow the malignant influence of radicalization and our failed state neighbors to intervene in our internal affairs. Their propaganda machinery has to be neutralized. That is the one part. And any terrorist, who comes as one Maulana of Azad Kashmir said, what Hamas did to Israel, we should do to Kashmir in India. So my reply to that Maulana would be, a general said, not, not my, this a general said, Maulana, we are waiting for you and your goons and to come to Kashmir. Rest assured, you will be dispatched to the happier world where the 72 hoors are waiting for you. So don't live in a fool's paradise. 
Don't live in a fool's paradise. Comparison should be between comparables and don't even think of going in for such a misadventure. There will be disastrous consequences for you, your families and your loved ones. The deadline issued by Pakistan for undocumented Afghan immigrants to cross over to Taliban-ruled Afghanistan has ended. It has become a matter of life, death and survival for thousands as they still remain stranded in the border areas. Despite international calls from the UN and other international agencies, Pakistan has started a crackdown on these people. They live their lives in tents and refugee camps, which have an entirely different set of difficulties. These Afghans are now hanging in between two regimes. On one side of the border, there is Pakistan, which has declared that it has nothing to do with them and has started a crackdown. And on the other side, there is the Taliban rule, which has been infamous for its rule with an iron hand policy, both of which are hard to survive. We have this report. Pakistan's deadline for undocumented Afghan immigrants to cross the border to the other side ended four days ago. But thousands of these Afghans still remain stranded in the border areas for days. These immigrants now face a double-edged problem for survival, hanging between Pakistan's crackdown and Afghanistan's ongoing human rights crisis. Mohammad Rahim, an undocumented Afghan immigrant, is fortunate enough to cross the border by bus before the deadline was issued by Pakistan. And now, will try to make a new life in Afghanistan, which is his homeland, just for namesake. If the government doesn't say anything, we don't go all our lives. I told you before, we know the people who live there. We have to live with the people who live there. We have to live with the people. बस हम हमारी सारी जिंदगी यही हो गई है हम इसी चीज़ से वाकिफ है यही बच्चे बड़े हुए हैं यही की पैदाइश है हमारी और कराची शहर को हम अच्छी तरीके से समझते भी हैं तो हम नहीं जाना चाहते हम हमें अगर ना भेजे तो हम तो सारी जिंदगी नहीं जाएंगे नॉट एवरी वन इज एज फॉर्चुनेट एज रहीम एज पाकिस्तान नाउ हैज स्टार्टेड अ मेजर क्रैक डाउन forcing these people to cross the border even when the United Nations Higher Commissioner for Refugees has warned otherwise. Following the inhuman orders issued by Islamabad, police recently destroyed a huge temporary settlement of Afghan refugees on the outskirts of Islamabad, merely hours after midnight of the deadline. This settlement was a home for hundreds of Afghan settlers. But amid the ongoing forced Afghan immigration, several people who have valid documents are also being forced to move. Such chaos on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, which has caused the deportation of thousands of undocumented Afghans towards doom, did not go unnoticed by the international forums. As the international body called up the Pakistani government to provide these refugees with protection and shelter. The issues and atrocities faced by Afghans trying to cross the Afghan Park border have made them vulnerable to the suppression of police which has been harassing these undocumented Afghans at this crucial time. The country here fails to realize that these Afghan refugees were not a problem to get rid of but were an asset that was generating business and employment for Pakistan that has been suffering on the economic front. कराची की पमाजत पर माजत ऐलान की चाह वानियां न वो जे गलत उन पर बाढ़ रोन न प्रिय दे दावरों रस्सा मसला दम मुर्द भाई पाकिस्तान को मत मुझे वाल वो बाई से उरोर दस दर बदर कुछ नहीं आजना ना दृश्य पे किस मुझ पर बाढ़ रोन प्रातु उरोर बाढ़ रोन बंदे रोज मुझ दरख्वास से वो कुमार सरोर दा बाढ़ रोन दिमुस्तखलास की मुझ दुखपल 
سندیانی اون پیسیا بانی و پات اسپرانه بیترانی اون پکی میخرسی کری کرام میکرا بانی را لام هر سه را نزود کرا پر پس را واقع استولو مخی نیوله اون وسی نیوله اون مدا وسی دا یا ورز مخ کرات لش پرز رو پیارا نواخ استلی هر یا ونیس پیسی جی نخلی بیخی علاقه خرا These Afghan refugees now face a life-threatening problem. On one side, they are being forced to vacate Pakistan, a country that was home to most of these immigrants for a major part of their life as they were born and brought up here. On the other side, there is the Taliban government, which has been inflicting atrocities on its people, forcing their version of religion. Seeing no light at the end of the tunnel, the problems faced by these Afghan immigrants now become worse by the day as life in their home country will be a continuous struggle and Pakistan, which was their shelter for years, will not accept them anyway. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa at anin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.